I like that when you use this word militant, because that's a very Christian word. I don't know if you know that. Um, <laughs> King talked about the marvelous new militants. See our language? That's why we have to, you know, the media, when they say militant, or when the extremists say militant, they use that as a code term. King actually used that in, in his speech, a marvelous new militancy. Um, Nonviolence is very violent to injustice. It breaks, it breaks at the consciousness. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, um, uh, it, I appreciate someone talk about talking about the violence of nonviolence. The violence of nonviolence. Um, you know, the scripture in the Bible where Jesus, people think that Jesus says, don't retaliate. When he says, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn up. He is, he said, no, he's actually saying, do retaliate. Retaliate with love. Retaliate with truth. Retaliate by turning the other cheek. Basically saying, as Walter Wink said, if you listen to what he says, once somebody takes in the right hand, he was describing a situation in Rome where the oppressor would slap you backhanded like you were a dog. Walter Wink said if they do that, don't react to that, turn the other cheek and make them slap you like a person. Make them actually see your personhood. And then retaliate by taking away their power, saying no matter what you do, you will not force me a certain way to act. I'm, I have something in me, as the, script, as the old songwriter said, that holdeth the rain, something in me that banishes all pain. I have a power beyond the power of your domination. And, I, and my mind and my intellect and my spirit has not been so captivated by your way of doing things that the only way I know to fight you is you. In other words, I refuse to become what I fight, which is the ultimate form of retaliation. Now, my women, well, just trigger the thought, you know, women have always been militant, the ones I know. <laughs> <laughs> That little daughter of mine, they call her Minnie Me. The little one y'all, Minnie Me. But, but, but really, in the Bible, in the Bible, for instance, there would have been no Moses without two militant women named Shipra and Pua. I tell all my friends, progressive friends, that threw your Bible away when Jerry Falwell and them messed it up. It is really better than what he preached. <laughs> you ought to pick it up, read it sometimes, some real good stuff in there. And there were two women, Shipra and Pua, and Pharaoh told them to kill every day. And they told him a lie. These, these were godly women that lied to power, because you, you don't have no obligation to tell power all your plans. <laughs> I know one day they got mad with us, they said, you didn't tell us you were going to get arrested today. I said, right. <laughs> You know, so, so they went back and they said to the women, look, Pharaoh told us to kill the baby, but we're going to help you have it. And so they had the baby. Moses was one of those babies. When Pharaoh came and said, I thought I told you. They said, Pharaoh, we didn't have nothing to do with it. These women, they, the babies were already born. They defied Pharaoh. I call them the midwives of emancipation. We've always said, the Bible talks about Deborah, powerful judge of Israel, the only woman judge of Israel who defied the system. Or Esther, who was caught up being a beauty queen and, and was enjoying her place, but then it came a time when her nation was under attack and her whole persona changed and she became a queen and a deliverer. Or Harriet Tubman, who was quite militant. Harriet Tubman, you know, was hit in the head at 14, but they caused her to have epilepsy the first rest of her life. So she would actually, when she, was, was rescuing people. One day they said that she was, um, she, she went to rescue slaves um, out of slavery. Her parents were there. He, she sent word to tell my mother and father to blindfold themselves so that when they talk to me tonight and when the master asked them tomorrow, did you see Harriet? They can say no. <laughs> they can say, give me, give me the second. They can say no. And then, um, I'm old back to preach. I got to run this rabbit before I can get to take your hand. And so, um, she also would fall out of sleep. You know, just fall out in the middle of the woods. And, 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 and she carried three things with her to get people free. She carried faith in God. She carried a knowledge of the North Star and moss on the north side of the tree and a 38 pistol. Now the 38 pistol was in case you decided you wanted to go back. Harriet would say, you gonna be free. <laughs> 
you, you, you gonna be free now. We didn't, we didn't, the Lord didn't bring us this far to leave us, so you gonna be free. Now either you gonna be free walking with us, or I'm gonna shoot you, and you gonna go on to heaven, but what you're not gonna do is go back and then the, the slave master beat you and tear away all the militant. Um, Sojourner Truth, who along with Frederick Douglass, was a part of the women's suffrage movement. Like, like history, people they don't teach us this in history class. Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, were a part of the suffrage. Sojourner Truth did this poem, Ain't I a Woman? And she basically said, so if you men folks say that one woman messed up the whole world in the Garden of Eden, don't you think all these women can straighten it out? <laughs> <laughs> Mary McLeod Bethune, who said of her own, I'm not a pretty woman, but demanded that she be with respect went down, began to build a college on a garbage dump. She had, Mary McLeod had more suitors than a model because she demanded respect. One time at one school, when she came in, the children laughed at her because of her skin color was so dark and her lips and all. She turned her back and just stood there for 30 minutes until there was a pin drop. And then she spoke and demanded respect. She said some things that the Roosevelt nobody else would say. Rosa Parks, this book called The Radical Life of Rosa Parks. The Radical Life of Rosa Parks. I've been spending time with um, Jean Theo Harris, the author of that book. Says so we got it all wrong. We think little Rosa Parks was somebody that just had this little hairdo. You know, we, the reason her hair was up like that because her husband loved it. And she never, she decided to keep it like that every day. Now her husband was abusive. But Rosa Parks, long before Dr. King investigated rapes in Deep South. And Rosa Parks said to a black man who wanted to date her, let me ask you a question, do you have a gun? Rosa Parks would ask a black man that wanted to date her, do you have a gun? If he said no, she said, well you don't want to date me because if you want to take me out as a black woman with all these black women I've seen rape and you don't have a gun with me, it means you are too scared to protect me. Rosa Park, I'm coming, Rosa Park was radical. Don't think that that, 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 those, that that march just happened. I've been reading that book about how the women, they had those flyers mimeographed long before she sat down. They knew exactly what they were doing. You see, and then all of the other things that she got involved. So there's always been, if you will, uh, a level of militancy. My mother, quick story, Rebecca Ellen is named after her. In, my mother and father integrated public schools in Washington County. My mother was the first black secretary at the all-white high school. Um, she's still there now, 83 years old, gets up every day and goes to work. I asked the mama, why don't you retire? She said, why? I said, just to rest. She said, no, they didn't want me to come here when I came. Now I'm gonna stay and leave when I want to. <laughs> That's what it is. But one day, my mother was brought up on charges of embezzlement and brought up on charges of, of malfeasance because they said she stole 50 cents. I'm, I remember this. I remember this. This is in the 1970s. 50 cents. My mother's militants. They said, if you will pay the 50 cents, we will put something in your record, but we won't fire you. My mother said, you must be crazy. And she, would, she came home every day for three weeks, fixed a meal, then taught black students, who, black children who couldn't afford it, how to play the piano. She's a, she's a classical pianist. Then she would leave and go back to the high school at night, they didn't have the computers then, and go through the ledgers <coughs> until she found where there was a zero, where there should have been a five, or a five where there should have been a zero, found the 50 cent, would not pay it. <laughs> then walked in to the principal, called a meeting with the principal and the superintendent, and said, here is the error. And if you ever challenge my integrity again, I will own this school system. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
actually, it's the history of women that is, runs through my, my vein. One more story, my grandmother. <laughs> but you shouldn't have mentioned women. My grandmother, I won't even talk about my wife's brother, who was, who was very strong there. But my grandmother was named Lettuce Ann Keys Robinson Moore. She had three husbands. They all died. She was with them a while. She didn't kill them. I know y'all got real quiet. <laughs> She's not that kind of militant. And at about 82, she went one night with me. She said, I want to go with you to preach revival. So she went with me. After the revival, I said, Grandma, how did I do? She said, you did all right. You preached the word. You know, I want my grandma to say, boy, you really preached. And he said, I said, Grandma, can't you say a little bit more? Like she said, I told you you preached. I told you that before, but that's not why I went to the revival with you. I'm looking for another husband. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to find some better revival because the pickings were mighty slim in there. <laughs> but I also remember one, one day when my grandmother, the Hyalic Myers, y'all don't remember Hyalic Myers. Remember Hyalic Myers? Anybody know about Hyalic Myers? Black people know about Hyalic Myers. That's what, we used to get all that cheap furniture from there. They get black people in debt by letting you get all this furniture on time. Y'all remember that? And then charge y'all that 19% interest and stuff. That's why Sophie and all them, we know about Hyalic Myers. But anyway, she had bought some a refrigerator from Hyalic Myers. And this was, this, and my grandmother, um, the guy came over the house and said, Miss Millie, they called Millie, said, you haven't um, paid your bill. And my grandma said, <clears throat> That's how she cursed. She didn't put the T on it. She said, shh. <laughs> she went out, she was one of, you know, godly women. You know, she would, she would curse, but she'd always just go, get right close to the edge. <laughs> so she said, mm, shh. <laughs> you know. And she said, mm, and she grunted. And she got up. And she, she had four locks on her door. She had a big, and she unlocked the locks. She went in, and she came out. This is, she came out and she had a box, and she put the box down there, right? She always kept a shotgun in the corner in case the foxes tried to get in her chicken coop. So she looked over there, checked the shotgun, and then she looked back at the guy and said, now, you said I did what? <laughs> and he said, she says, she, he said, you didn't pay, she said, right there. She said, January, the bills, the receipts, February, March, and she went all the way through. He said, oh ma'am, I, I didn't make it. She said, no, no, sit here now. Sit here now. And she went down. He said, well, can I have a glass of water? She said, Billy, give him a plastic cup. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then, when she finished, she says, now, I, I was gonna pay this through the rest of the year, but she went in an apron, y'all, and pulled out a wad of money, and paid the entire rest of the bill and she would not touch his hand. She put it on the table, made him pick it up, and said, boy, <laughs> don't ever come back to my house. I don't know what made you think in her own broken life that we don't pay our bills. There was a level of demanding respect. She never raised her voice, but there was a militancy about challenging the system, system. So I believe there's always been, in many ways, a lot of militancy among women. Yeah. Yeah. So, militant, maybe militaristic, not me. You know, uh, the, we were kind of talking, I think, before you came in about, you know, Wilson and turn of the century and, you know, trying to uh, promote World War I as, as uh, bringing democracy to the world. Um, and uh, I'm kind of struck, I'm new to the South and new to the mountains, uh, relatively. Uh, and bringing it back to right now, you know, we got a lot of militant uh, people or, or who think of themselves as militant who, who when I drive to my place in Candler, you know, I'm, I'm driving past these signs, get your Confederate flags here, you know, this reaction. Okay, and these, these are, you know, gun rights folks, but they're folks who also, you know, have pride and independence. I mean, I think they're 
lot of ignorance and I mean I'm not. But what what I mean I don't know who can answer this question, but it seems like you know as far as this kind of um, some of that does seem to have a history of, of militant independence from the kind of nation state and nationalism and but they don't call they don't call themselves militant. If you ever know, they call us militant. See, that's what I'm saying. When Dr. King was doing nonviolent, the same people that were hanging people were calling him militant. What I'm saying is oftentimes, like Dr. King, we have to have the movement imagination and creativity to snatch terms away from the powers of domination and free them up for their proper use. And so that's why Dr. King said a marvelous new militancy, which means I'm distinctively, not, he wasn't talking about militarism, neither am I, you know, talking about my grandmother and my mother are not, you know, pro-war, pro-hanging people. That's, that, that's crazy. That ain't militant. <clears throat> that's sick. You know, that's racist. Uh, it's, it's hatred. It's pure hatred. But this sense that what my friend is talking about and what we're talking about is that if you think you can intellectualize people to change. <laughs> that, that, that you don't have to engage action. Um, what we've learned in the Moral Monday movement is that we could have gone to, down to the legislature for uh, 40 times and they would have just seen it as a rally. But when people were engaging in a marvelous new militancy and nonviolent direct action, when we were nonviolently challenging the systems of violence, um, it forced a new conversation. It forced people to take a second look, which is why now when we started, only 40% of North Carolinians wanted Medicaid expansion, but now 60% want it. You see, the, the consciousness is changed because something has to shock people. Truth shocks. Truth, you know, it, it, it is like a, a, a battering ram against the, 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 um, the walls and the fortresses that do, dom, domination puts up to blind people or to block people from even thinking in new ways. You gotta crack through all of that stuff. And so there is a sense in which if there is no fight in your truth, your truth will not last long. But now we, we choose how we fight. We choose that. And so we do it in a way, uh, Coretta Scott King said, when she was defining violence, Coretta Scott King uh, defined viol violence like this. When they said, the I said, what is violence? And Coretta Scott King said, well, it's not just my husband getting shot. She said, violence is starving a child. Violence is not giving somebody labor rights in a living way. This is Coretta. She said, violence is not providing health care. Violence is police brutality. But then she also said this, violence is an apathetic attitude that refuses to challenge justice. So actually, if I am apathetic and refuse to speak truth, I'm actually engaging in a form of violence according to the logic of, and I refuse to engage in that kind of violence. By being I think, <clears throat> You know, and, and in regard to the, you know, the sort of running away from the term of, of militancy or being too careful about it, or, or you know, you think about in the post-Reagan era what happened to the word liberal. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a real violence right. that's done to yourself and to your society when you allow yourself to be defined by the people, your opposition. That's right. That's right. And if you, you know, instead of saying, I stand here, you know, liberal means something important about how I define myself and what I mean to myself and what I'm willing to do to defend those values and those principles. And, and then suddenly um, somebody else makes liberal, you know, a bad term, you know, a, a somebody you, um, who's, who's weak, who's too progressive, who's whatever they are. And you say, oh, I'm not a really a liberal. Yeah. You know, that's pathetic. And we did it. As a society, we ran away from that term. Yeah. And, and feminism. Like feminism, yeah. Oh, and, and, and that's one of the beauties of Moral Monday. That's what you all have helped. You know, you know, this area is the only area where incumbent Tea Party is lost in the country in the state race. Because you change the conversation that allows you to change the consciousness that then allows you to engage in concrete action. The reality is, 
empires, the first thing an empire does when it conquers another area is it, it goes after the libraries, the treasury, and the language. The first point of domination is to make the indigenous people's language second class. So you, you see, because once you make the language second class, you've, 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 you've made the people. So part of the a moral movement, Jesus, the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. One of the greatest things that you've done through Moral Monday movement is change the language. So we, watch this. So we say we're not going to have a left-right debate. First of all, because we're not in the 17th century French Revolution where that came from. <laughs> it's the wrong century. Left was the people who didn't want the monarchy, right did. We said we're going to have a constitutional debate. What? We, we're not going to allow um, um, some extremists to say they own the Constitution. We're going to have a moral discussion. We're going to have an economic discussion, all right? We're not going to call people right that we believe are wrong. Why would we linguistically keep beating up on ourselves? Why would you keep calling somebody right, the right, the right, the right? You're defeating your, every time you say that, you're, you're hurting yourself. So what do we call them? Extremists. Huh? Regressives. We're not going to use the language. We're, I'm a, I don't know if y'all know this, I'm a, I, I, I go around telling people I'm a conservative. Now how you like that? Wait a minute, no, they're not gonna define me as a liberal. I'm liberal and conservative, depending on whether I'm using ketchup or hot sauce. <laughs> but I'm a liberal because I believe in liberty, right? I'm a conservative because I wanna conserve the essence of our deepest moral faith truths and our deepest constitutional truth. Those people who want to undermine justice can't be conservative because conserve means to hold on to the essence of. Well, if you are doing everything you can to undermine the establishment of justice, how dare you take language and call yourself a conservative? You see what I'm saying? So like, that's what the moral movement has done. We, we, we've talked about, we, we don't, we say, people ask me sometimes, say, well, who's in the moral movement? The black or white people? I said black and white and brown and Asian and gay and straight. And they said, wait a minute, we don't have enough time on the media. I said, but you asked the question. <laughs> See, I'm not going to let you pigeonhole us. We're not going to let you, what, what is the moral Monday movement? It is a, it is a, it is a, it is a state government focus, deeply moral, deeply constitutional, anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-labor, pro-justice, transformative fusion movement. You, you, you see, you, you don't, 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 you know, you, it's like Jesus in the parable. You take the language and you flip it over. You see, you flip it because if you use, the language of domination is designed to, 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 to um, deceive people and to undermine our ability to debate. <clears throat> it's designed that way. <clears throat> so you cannot challenge domination and the language of empire with the empire's language. I, and I'm, we're trying to teach this all over the country. I don't know why in the world uh, people keep saying, we, we're almost through, I don't know why in the world people keep saying, you know, this, I heard it the other day, this left, right. Or the other day, uh, uh, a, um, <clears throat> a um, commentator allowed one of these extremists to say, I would come listen to the Pope if he preached orthodox theology. And I, I was screaming at TV, why don't you all have some, 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 some real evangelicals? I'm an evangelical, by the way, because I want to spread justice. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Well, why don't you have some real evangelicals on the TV? So when he says orthodox theology, what do you mean the Pope's not preaching orthodox theology? Orthodox theology, the original theology of Jesus starts with this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. The poor. And the poor in that context, it comes from a Greek word, patokos, which does not mean poor who, who are made poor because they won't do anything. It means those who have been made poor by systemic decisions that create the poverty. You, you see what I'm saying? You have to... So a, a, a moral movement is trying to shift people's imagination. If the imagination changes, then we can implement. But you can't implement anything if we're, still, if we're still captured by the imagination of the empire. And the only way you can un unleash the imagination is through language, truth telling. Truth telling that breaks it open. That says, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
And so that's where we are, my friends, in this whole business of truth telling and, and using this language. So I'm encouraging all of you, don't use the language of, 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 of domination. We use the language of liberation. It, it, nobody should be able to get away in a country where the Constitution just says the first four principles is not liberty. It's not liberty. It's the establishment of justice, promoting, providing the general, promote, providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare. Worst thing progressives ever did, or liberals, or whatever we want to call them, I don't like using those terms, is to allow welfare to become a bad word when welfare is in the Constitution. It's right there. And, and, and so, what we say is, we're saying nobody should be able to beat us in a debate when you stand up and say to the American people, elect me, I can take you to a greater world, a greater America, and this is how we're gonna do it. Elect me, and we're gonna get, have a better America by denying money for public education and teachers. Elect me, we're gonna deny health care and let people die. Elect me, we're gonna take money from the unemployed. Elect me, and we're gonna hurt uh, the working poor. Elect me, we're going to attack women. Elect me, we're going to attack the LGBT community. Elect me, and in a country of immigrants, we're going to hurt immigrants. Elect me, and, and we're going to rob people of their voting rights. And if you elect me, we're going to do one final thing to make sure we have a great America, and that is make it easier to get a gun than it is to vote. If we can't debate that, that's not their problem, that's our problem, because we haven't changed the land. <laughs> Two things. One is that I'm going to take this guy with me from yeah. now on. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Wherever I go. <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, there's a second part to this event which involves a lot of kids who made all the portraits that are on the walls coming up the stairway. They're here now and we need to bring them in and uh, there's going to be a conversation with them. And uh, that doesn't mean any of you have to leave, but we need to go on, right? And so. Um, I, I, want, I want to apologize. Thank you very much. No, no, that was fantastic. Preach! Aren't they wonderful? Yeah! Thank you so much. We're going to do this revival too. We need to have a serious conversation. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen the paintings? No, I haven't. Seen. Oh my God! Oh, you got to get up there. Five minute break to transition the room into the education program for the children. Please uh, join us back quickly and make.